Welcome to Electron Line. Now let's summarize what we know about finite wells or particles inside finite wells. We realize that we have the solution to the Schrodinger equation being different inside the barriers. There's actually a probability the particle will be there and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we realize that the solution to the equation for region 1 looks like this and for region 3 looks like this. In other words, we can see that we have a decay function to the left in region 1 and a decay function to the right in region 3. And in region 2, where the particle has energy above the absolute floor, zero energy level of the floor, we can see that the equation will look sinusoidal, they'll have a sine and a cosine portion of that, and we can then see that there's various ways in which the particle can, can exist within that region, within the, the, the well portion, and that's going to depend on some quantum number of energy levels. So for example, we have E sub 1, E sub 2, E sub 3, which then provides a certain type of waveform for the particle within the well. We can see that we'll see an increasing number of wavelengths as the energy increases for the particle, and the energy is then defined as being n squared, pi squared, h bar squared, divided by 2m times l squared, l being the length of the well. This is again a one-dimensional well. In order for the equations to match, we, may, we must make sure that at x equals 0, that the value of the function on the left side inside the barrier is equal to the value of the function of the particle inside the well. And also that the slope of the two functions, the derivative of the two functions of, lambda, of, of the function 1 and the function 2, that the slopes equal as well. So not only do the value of the function have to equal, but the slopes have to equal as well. And at x equal l, no different, the value of the function at region 2 must equal the value of the function at region 3, and the slope of region 2 must equal the slope of region 3. So that's why we know that there's only specific values of the functions that can, that can exist. One thing that we haven't discussed yet is that it turns out that inside a finite well, the actual wavelength is a little bit larger than the wavelength would be if we're an infinite well. For example, the wavelengths here of a particle in a finite well are slightly longer than those of a particle in an infinite well of the same width. Because therefore, in an in infinite well, we know that the, the wavelength must stop exactly at the boundary, but in a finite well, we know the particle goes to slightly beyond the boundary, and for the two functions to line up, we have to have a wavelength that's slightly longer than the width of the well. In other words, for energy level 1, we know that the wavelength is such, or the motion of the particle is such, that the length of the well equals a half a wavelength. But actually, in a finite well, the half a wavelength is actually a little bit longer than the length of the well. For energy level 2, we know that the wavelength normally should equal the length of the well, but in a finite well, we know that the wavelength is slightly longer than the width of the well. And that has as a result, since the wavelength is equal to h over the momentum of a particle, or the momentum is h over lambda, however you want to explain that, you can then say that the momentum is smaller for a particle in a finite well than for a particle in an infinite well for the same energy level. So for energy level 1, energy level 2, energy level 3, the momentum will be slightly smaller for a particle inside a finite well compared to a particle in an infinite well of the same width. And that's because the wavelengths don't quite match up. The wavelengths are a little bit longer than the width of the well or the length of the well, however you want to look at it. So those are some of the key constraints of a particle inside a finite well. And if you follow those, you can see that we have specific values for E sub n for the various energy levels and specific values for the penetration depth, depending upon the mass of the particle and the value of the energy of the particle. And so that's how we can define strict rules to find the equations exactly that match inside and outside the well and allow us also to find the penetration depth. And that's how we work with potential finite wells.